So it's a pretty small group, so I think we can be interactive, um, which means I will ask you questions. Um, uh, so thank you for that introduction. That, that actually did cover a, a number of things. Um, I am a practicing architect, um, and I, I want to make a very small point about that just at the beginning um, and as a prelude to the, the research work. Um, I did my undergraduate work at MIT um, and then uh, did a Master of Architecture at Princeton and, and graduate studies at, at Columbia and uh, been a practicing architect, as John said, but very much with a foot in the research world now for the last 12 years, really. Um, I'm most interested in doing work that's going to have impact. So that's why I'm presenting the urban metabolism work today. Um, urban metabolism, what is that? Um, before I get to that. So as a practicing architect, this is one, uh, my wife and I have a firm, we've had it for about 10 years. And as a practicing architect, it's very clear to me that um, there are very, some very, very low tech, very um, uh, sensical solutions to a low energy built environment. Um, this is a building, a very, pretty small building, 1,800 square feet, a full concrete basement, which acts as a thermal sink for the building. Um, it's uh, essentially a passive house, but doesn't, it's not under the passive house guidelines, but essentially does not need any heating or cooling. This is in the Hudson Valley, so it gets quite cold and quite hot. There's another building, which is in addition to a Victorian, and acts as a heat exchanger, really, for the entire building. And again, the full concrete basement that acts as a heat sink in the summer, and that can be closed off and provides natural ventilation for the rest of the building. Um, the point I'm making, the point I want to start out with is that there are some very straightforward solutions to some very, very um, ambitious aspirations that we have. And that is a sustainable, or what the phrase I prefer using is resource efficient built environment. Um, uh, the, this is another project in which the configuration of the building and the roof itself uh, lent itself to the best solar heat gains in the winter and the best shading uh, from solar heat gains again in the summer. Um, and that, that's one part of the work that I've done, that's practice. And the other part that I want to talk about is the beginning of the research work that I did at MIT that had everything to do with materials. So the first half of my career at MIT, I've been at MIT for um, so 14 years almost, um, the first six years was in materials, new materials for buildings. We developed a number of different materials, one of which just recently is a cellular concrete, an aerated concrete. And there's a material already, which is autoclave, aer aerated autoclave concrete, but it's very high in embodied energy. Does anybody know that material? Ever seen that material? Foamed concrete? Very interesting material, but it's quite high in embodied energy. And our interest was to develop a a foamed concrete or a cellular concrete at room temperature, and we did that. Um, and there's some very good biological analogs to foamed or cellular structures and materials. But the more important point is there are there's there's more there are better analogs that show variable density in that cellular structure. So the, this section of bamboo you can see quite dense and less dense, and this bone fragment section that is often shown by architects where there's a whole, there's a, you can see very clearly there's a variable density. So we set out to make a concrete that was variable dense, variably dense. And so we had a number of different techniques to do that um, and actually did get, without mechanical, this is a, partly using a centrifuge to change the density, but we actually ended up with a concrete that, um, that is variably dense just by pouring it. You pour it into a cast, and it establishes a variable density. Okay. That is all in prelude to what I really want to talk about today, and that is the urban metabolism work. The reason I show that work is because it became very clear to me as an architect that designers make huge decisions. They make decisions that have huge consequences in terms of material flows. So the material throughput of society that you can directly attribute to construction is about 70%. 60 to 70 percent of all materials that flow through society are related to construction. Okay, so designers, engineers included, how many engineers in the room or engineering students? How many architecture students? Okay, you and me, 
Okay? <laughs> so um, the designers make decisions that are within a con context of resource flows. And it's rare that that designer really understands the full consequences of the resource flows that they are setting in motion when they make design decisions. So the, as an architect, I'm very interested in that idea, and I'll return to it right at the end of the presentation, how do you educate designers who are making decisions with an informed sense of the resource consequences? Not just the energy, but the whole material flow. And then second, the materials work that I was doing is all individual materials for high performance buildings. And the question I asked and my group asked ourselves was, what are the real consequences of developing resource efficient materials at the society level, at a much greater scale? So that's where urban metabolism comes in. So there are six pieces to this presentation. I've got 78 slides or something like that. I tend to move through them pretty quickly, so I, I do want to spend just 45 minutes on the talk. Um, the first is the context of the urban world. We'll talk a little bit about the, the motivation behind the work that we're doing. Urban metabolism, I'll introduce that as the framework for uh, the work I'm going to show today. Then talk about two main projects, urban morphology, so how do you link urban form to resource flows? And then the second project is, do we have city types? Are there cities that are like one another? Can we derive a typology of cities based on their urban resource consumption? So that'll be the second big project. I'll talk a little bit about urban technologies. And then the last piece is just a little bit about education and a talk about a project that I've been involved in for the last four years in Singapore. Okay, first part. So the urban world, maybe some of you know this. So do you take urban planning classes? Anybody take planning or urban? Yeah, some, to some extent. Okay, so maybe you know some of this. The increase in urban population in the 20th century and continuing now is just unprecedented. It's wild. Um, sometime, um, well, I'll get to that. The, the, the increase is also um, very uneven globally. So as you can see, Asia in absolute numbers, urban population increase. Asia is really outstripping all the rest, the rest of the world. Um, and again, this partly came out of thinking about construction where in 2005, half the construction in the world was in China. We already knew that, and it's pretty much continuing since then. Um, and, and then some, significantly, some significant upticks in urban population in Africa, especially in the poorest part of the world. So, an example I like to show is, um, this is a fishing village in southeast coast of China um, in 1982, I believe. Um, around then it was designated um, a special economic zone. Um, and the population back then, estimates, because it was hard to get, come by numbers, hard numbers, but estimates were 20 to 30,000. And that is that place today, same exact place. It's Shenzhen. Anybody ever been there? Anybody from there? Yeah? 14 million in the, the amount of time in that path. There's never been uh, that kind of urbanization in human history. It's unbelievable. Um, but, the, but the more important story, because that looks kind of like a nice city, right? Looks pretty well developed, nice sunny day. The reality is that in the next uh, 30 years, um, we're going to be adding the same number of people who live in cities today, again. So about 3.2 billion live in cities today. We're adding about 3.2, 3.4 in the next 30 years to cities. To China alone is gonna add 250 million in the next 15 years or 10 years. And 90% of that urbanization or increase in urban population is happening in the developing world. So it's this, is, this is actually more the character of urbanization than the Shenzhen model. Now, I think a number of you might know that. Um, it's, not, it's a pretty well-known figure that in around 2008, we went from primarily rural population in the world to primarily urban, so 50%. And now it's, I think, something like 54%, 55%. And that um, is uh, scheduled, predicted, plus or minus, um, to hit something like 65% sometime in the next 25 years. 
Uh, there's good evidence that shows that once we hit 65%, some places will de-urbanize. And so steady state will be somewhere around 65 or so percent, which means, again, like I said before, we're adding 3 billion people to cities. Um, what's not as well known, and this is what I, this, the whole motivation bef behind what I wanted to do in urban metabolism is say, what are the resource consequences of this, really? I mean, what does this mean in terms of material, energy, everything else? So something that we developed, we um, did a really lar extensive literature review, took a good nine months or so, and established that between 1900 and 2000 the 20th century, there, we did also cross a threshold around 1962-ish, and that was where the material throughput, so if you take all the materials that pass through society and you designate it renewable or non-renewable, and renewable biomass, you know, fluorofauna, non-renewable metals and minerals, we went from st substantially a, a, a substantially renewable basket of materials to a non-renewable basket today. And you can argue why this is the case and why this happened. A very strong element of that, I argue and lots of others agree, is urbanization. Because uh, cities are made of uh, substantially non-renewable materials. So metals and minerals, so infrastructure itself, buildings, um, all that stuff. So I wanted to really look at, well, what does this really mean if we're going to be adding a huge number of new city residents? Just to give you some absolute numbers, just to put this in perspective. So at the beginning of the 20th century, um, so 7.4 gigatons were extracted from Earth. That's, that's the, full volume, the full weight of materials that were extracted from the Earth's core. And at the end of the 20th century, so um, about 60 gigatons. It just so happens that, so there's a huge, huge increase in material um, extraction. Um, if you compare that to the growth in the economy, um, the global economy actually dematerialized during the 21st century. So actually we created wealth with less and less materials over, 20, over, the, over that century, which is a really good thing. And that just happened. It didn't happen by any you know, wholesale um, uh, acceptance of sustainable con economy or any of that. It just happened because it's cheaper, it's easier, it's better, and technology generally drives in that direction. You develop, you, you're able to do more with less over time. So we wanted to investigate that in terms of cities. So now I've been talking a lot in terms of globe and the global uh, dynamics and large societal um, dynamics. And so we wanted to take that down to cities. And so we've done that over the f past few years. We've been doing this work for about five years. Um, and so one way to think about cities is the same way to think about cities that we've been thinking about buildings, and that's in terms of life cycles, in terms of lifetimes. And what are the characteristic stages of the life of the city? And we've, this is uh, uh, quite an old diagram from 2007, but we've, I've got a couple papers where we show that this actually is happening where there are three stages in urbanization. There's the, and maybe it's, a lot of it's kind of common sense, but the first stage is rapid urbanization, the founding of the city and the building of it, and so huge material input, and then the associated energy increase um, as more people move to the city and expands. Then there's a second stage, which is a stabilizing stage where the physical extent of the city and the population um, stabilize, plateau, and the material input still non-zero, but it can plateau. It's plateaus and then it goes down. So the example I like to give is, for example, central Paris, which developed, redeveloped, destroyed. But right now it's pretty much, it's the way it's gonna be for the next few hundred years. You're not gonna see skyscrapers in the middle of Paris, right? So, there, and, this, and the population is pretty much stable. It's actually depopulated, like a lot of the wealthier city centers. Um, They've depopulated, unfortunately. But the, so, the, the, so the population is fairly stable, which means that the in material input, the actual amount of material that's put into that space is decreasing over time. 
And then the third stage is incremental densification, and that's where the city just sort of fills in the gaps. And so material, I've described mostly material here. Um, and what happens with energy is different. Energy increases, and it increases through stabilizing. And the thing about this, um, the reason why this happens is energy continues to increase when material decreases because if the city is healthy, and that's the assumption here, and the population is stable, the, the city is doing what it does best. Every city does one thing best, and that is create wealth, create affluence. So as you create affluence, energy um, consumption almost always increases. In fact, it always does increase. We're not finding any examples where it decreases, really. Um, so energy increases, and maybe it doesn't plateau. I just want to add an addendum to that. Just very recently, a, a colleague, Chris Kennedy at University of Toronto, maybe has found some evidence for some northern European cities um, being able to actually decrease their energy consumption while maintaining their economy. And so the fourth, so the, we're, then those were the three stages. And now I'm adding a pre-urban stage, and now I'm adding a transition. Now the pre-urban stage is when, you know, before the city, and you have also hinterland production. The hinterland is the area or the region from which the city draws resources. And hinterland produ pr production is the highest when there's no city. There's no draw on it. There's no, and what I mean is the actual, um, yeah, the actual production of the hinterland. And it does necessarily decrease because it's being drawn on, it's being degraded as the city increases. The last stage here is what everybody talks about, sustainable cities. You know, how do we make that transition so that energy comes down, water comes down, and materials come down? Okay, so that's the whole, that's the whole prelude to urban metabolism. You guys want to run for the hills at this point? Is this what you were expecting? Yeah, okay, all right, good. So urban metabolism um, was a thing that we joined. So urban metabolism has its history back to about 1965. Abe Woman wrote a paper in Scientific American a uh, thought experiment of a million people, and he posed the question, what do they consume? Um, so he just water, biomass, whatever else. And uh, urban metabolism came out of that as the field that's the study of the physical flows required to serve the urban economy. So this is very closely aligned with urban economics and basically is the physical corollary to urban economics. So what does it take to run a city? Um, there are lots, there, there's a whole range of urban metabolism approaches. Um, there's the whole thermodynamic, full material and energy flows. And then there's a simplified, more simplified version. I'd say my group and I think the community in general, because there is a community of urban metabolists, is tending towards this model because it's a little bit more actionable. So our, and okay, and so some of the work that we've done recently, and this is just an example to give you um, this is the actual urban metabolism for one year of Lisbon, Portugal. We did this a few years back. And, you know, you have all of the imports. You have the additions to stock. So this is the infrastructure, buildings, anything else. Um, and then you have the exports, the, the things that leave the urban. So just to give you some sense of what we're talking about here in terms of overall volume, a city like Lisbon, which is in a transition economy, and maybe it's taken a couple steps backwards in the last couple years, but transition economy meaning that it's between the agricultural, industrial, cheap labor, light manufacturing, and the service economy right, of industrialized cities. A person consumes about 20 tons per capita. That's very typical of a transition economy city. The lowest we've ever found is um, cities in the poorest, so sub-Saharan African cities are about five to seven. And there's some cities that that five to seven is less that's, than is physiologically possible for people to live in that city. So there's clearly some data problems. And the highest is Singapore, which we found to be now, uh, we think now it's 75 tons per capita. Right? So the, that's the range from five to seven to 75, so it's a huge range. The, our interpretation of the, the master diagram, the material flow for cities is this one. So I really hesitate to put up this diagram and I, I really, I don't think I have any equations either. So I, at least I didn't do that. But 
So the diagram is pretty straightforward, though. This is the urban economy. This is a system boundary for the urban economy. These are the inputs, and these are the outputs. This shaded area is the socio-environmental interface. So that just means the interface between the human world and the rest of the urban world. So in here is flora, fauna, literally birds and plants and uh, biogeochemical cycle cell, rain, and all the passive inputs, basically, right? Things we don't control, and passive outputs. By the way, you guys live in a beautiful area of the country. It's, I, I was just thinking today about Boulder, about this diagram. This is really intense in this part of the country. And in, in, in Boston, it's not as intense, although, you know, it's, anyway. Um, the human part of the urban economy is this, so the active inputs, um, and all the ones that you would expect, water, energy, materials, biomass. There's some hid regional hidden flows often. But the way to look at this human portion, the anthropogenic portion, is that, okay, so that's, the, that's that economy. And what the driver to this are the things that we want in a city. And these are the exact same amenities that urban economics identifies, right? So if you've read any urban economics, Krugman and Fujita and others, there are basically three things that cities provide. And they put this in terms of amenities and firms and workers and all that. So goods and services, the built environment and infrastructure, and urban economics makes a big point about housing and then transportation. And urban, eco urban economics says, you know, the, uh, the, the city ideal is that as you get closer and closer and become more and more urbanized, transportation costs go to zero. You can walk to work, right, or, or so. so that's, urban economics, the inputs here, and then the outputs there, okay? So we are tying our physical flows with the financial flows that have been al already identified in, in, in urban economics. So that's our, our diagram. And then, as I mentioned before, the enormous um, resource requirements of cities regionally, nationally, and globally have to do with the fact that they add a hu huge amount of material that is in place. It stays there. Um, the, this university, all the buildings, are going to be here for a while, right? They're not going to go away. Okay. Um, a couple of different ways in which we are approaching, or, or how we approached the, um, a comprehensive sense of the resource requirements of cities, is to begin to map um, the different elements of the city population density. So this is just a <coughs> fairly typical population per kilometer squared of Atlanta, Georgia, and if anybody, if you, any of you know about the Thule model for urban economics, it's, you know, it's very, very typical, you know, um, uh, population density towards the center and then, and then dispersed. And what we do with that is we develop urban resource intensity maps. So this is a map of that same area in Atlanta, Georgia, and this is about um, 25 kilometers, 30 kilometers in diameter, I think it's 30. Um, so kilometers traveled per household to 19 services. So this means, so the, the graph is showing, the surface is showing the very, very low energy intensity in transportation, quite low here in the valleys, and then quite high, um, mostly on the periphery. So this is, again, this is a sort of an inverse map of this, basically showing for denser population, your, po your transportation energy is low, right? The interesting thing about this is that there are many areas that are pretty far away from the city center that have very, very low transportation energy. And these are walkable districts. Um, these are districts that are, have the right, kind of the sweet spot, the right mix of services and transportation mode choices. Okay, so that's partly what we do. The second thing that we do is a little bit more traditional, and that's the actual accounting for um, urban resources um, in one city, and so this, again, is taking that, those three activities, the inputs, the outputs, the urban activities driving that, the extraction from this city, and the additions to stock, or the sink in the city, and this is Singapore. So Singapore is a kind of a unique example that we use because it's a city-state. It's also an island, so, so international trade is what the, the data that we can use, which makes it really easy compared to most other cities. Um, the, so these, sorry for the equation. So, you know, input plus extraction is gonna equal the output plus 
the additions to the, the, the sink and then the addition to stock. So the urban metabolism model basically says that this is a mass balance model. Whatever goes in stays in, right? So that's, that's, that's what we work with. Yeah, so the, that's, that's a distinction though. Um, the sink is landfill, is waste in the city. To, in Singapore, it's trivial, and in a lot of cities, it's, it's going to zero. The additions to stock is increasing because it's up. Okay. okay, and Singapore has, is, a, is a great example also because the urbanization is, is up until China started to urbanize, um, unprecedented. So the additions, this, uh, these are imports and exports, and Singapore exports are. The, I think the first, maybe second uh, largest oil refinery, <coughs> oil refining um, city in the world. Um, exports have increased dramatically, but this is really a, a measure of, or an indication of economic development. And back in 1962, it's basically a third world, back then was called a third world nation. And today it has the highest per capita GDP in the world. So partly what we also do is to link Though that understanding of this flow of resources driven by those urban activities, and we set them in relation to one another. Um, this, is, this one in particular is a work from one of my students. What are the water resources and the demand? So what's the water situation in a city? And this is for Singapore. And so this, the, we're developing these sorts of things because we want to be able to play out scenarios, global climate change and others. Um, and we found a couple of things. Um, and this is more general to, than just to Singapore. So for example, we found that the different resources display or demonstrate different dynamics in terms of the growth of the city. So this is domestic material consumption. This is all of the materials consumed by a city, the full basket. And as the gross national income, so a measure of affluence, increases, material consumption increases at some power, right? sometimes exponential, but at some power. Electricity almost always increases linearly. Don't, don't exactly know why. Water is interesting because it increases, but then in a lot of cities, it's, the, it's really the only resource that we see where cities are successful at reaching a plateau and then being more efficient while the, the economy continues um, expanding. So they have very different dynamics. Why is this important? Because in Singapore and in China and other rapidly urbanizing places, you know, the addition, this is a, this is a model in the Urban Redevelopment Authority, and this is showing in gray all the new construction um, that's planned, already approved. Um, Anybody been to Singapore recently? Oh, you can. So you've seen this, the Marina Bay Sands. So this should, this is an old photograph, so this should be in brown color. But you know this is enormous. I mean, it's, it's unbelievably large. It's it almost, when in, in construction, it looked like an oil refinery, frankly. It looked like a, a huge piece of infrastructure. So this amount of infrastructure is unbelievably large. Singapore has asked us to account for the resource requirements of this sort of thing. What will it take to do this? Because they don't have any resources. They have to import 100% of the material that goes into every single one of these buildings. So they're interested. We're also doing this, we've transferred some of this work to the states. So very recently we finished a complete urban metabolism model of the Back Bay in Boston. So that's the Charles River, some of you know Boston. This is the southeast edge of, of that river. This is the Back Bay, one of the um, most beautiful historic neighborhoods in Boston. And I have two students who actually went and, and found all the information and actually did on-site surveys to account for all the material there already, um, what's been placed in this part of Boston. And, and the purpose for this is to um, investigate what it will take to make this energy efficient. So what, what's the material input? What are the resource consequences of deciding that you have, a, say, a CO2 emissions reduction target? Okay, that leads to this project. So all of that was the, and that's probably 10 projects right there that I've really condensed. All of that work was done within the first, first four years. And at the end of four years, we decided, well, we need to put 
some useful, we can do this work forever, but we'd like to put some useful tool online. So um, we published this. So let me go, I'm gonna spend, what time is it? It's 4.04, .04. okay. I'm gonna spend 10 minutes on this demo. So this is online. Um, it's herbmet.org, so you can play with this. Um, my students, every once in a while, they, they take it offline to, to work on it. But basically, this, what this is, let me take you back to the, to the beginning. You get this page, um, and you can enter a name. We, currently, we have 44 American cities. We have two uh, English cities, London and Manchester. We're about to finalize details on a project to, to put 500 cities into this um, around the world. But if I type in one city, New York, um, you'll get a Google map. You can then um, zoom in, zoom out. And the question we wanted to provide answers for are if I wanted to know just in some kind of general, relative, comparative way, what the material and energy requirements of the city or a piece of the city was, how could I do that? So this is the result of one five-year PhD. Um, and no status quo. What's there now? Right. So one question that we wanted to get at in the survey metabolism work was to answer what we didn't think was out there, and that is what are the resource requirements of cities today? Do we know what they are? And it's um, a lot of disparate information. But so in this um, analyzer, you can draw an area. So let's say the, actually, let me take this and do Midtown. And the area doesn't really matter, and how precise I am in drawing it doesn't really matter, because the return, the output is per capita numbers, right? So this is all normalized to per capita uh, consumption. So for this area that I've delineated, I'm gonna get a material kilogram per person, a kilowatt hour per person, and then a population density if I analyze this. Okay, so this is what I get, and I get, eventually I'm gonna get a population heat map here. This is, these are the colors of the population five, below 5,000 per kilometer squared and then up to 25. For some reason that isn't coming up. Oh, there it goes, okay? So that's a population heat map. So four materials here, if you were living here, you would be responsible for, or the city would be providing you per capita about 60,000 kilograms in infrastructure and about 24,000 for buildings and in, in uh, materials. And for energy, you'd be responsible for roughly 4,000 kilowatt hour in transportation, gas, and electricity. And the population density here is 18,000. So let's, let's go a little bit further afield and say the West Village, which I believe somewhere in and here, well, let's let's draw a wide, a wide, a large area. So, including you, okay. Yeah. Census data. Yep. Is this inventory or inventory? Inventory. It's all in, in place. Yeah. Inventory. Okay. So now, so the use of this is not the absolute numbers, really, in my mind. The use of this is the comparison. So look at the comparison. So here I've got infrastructure of 5,000. I've got a, pop a, high, a bigger population, a more dense population. I've got much lower buildings and maybe less wide streets. Maybe there's more population per road network. And energy is also lower. So the point of this tool is to be able to go to different parts of a city or even so now let's go, oops, let's do that. Let's go to Harlem. 
I'm impressed with the speed of your network. Now let's see what we get. So analyze. Okay, so the previous one was West Village. For some reason, not returning any, any material. So my student probably took off the database for Harlem here for material. Um, uh, energy a little higher. Electricity definitely. Electricity is almost, hmm, almost you know, about eighty percent higher. And gas, you know, is actually not too so maybe double. Population density is higher. So forty-two thousand per kilometer squared. That's a little unbelievable, but I think that's I think that is the right number. Okay, so this is one. So this is this is a an output from our work. I tell you, when we produce this, we spent all this time doing this, I was skeptical that it was useful, and then I actually presented it at an American Planning Association conference, and there was a lot of interest. Um, and I'll show you what we did then. Oh, actually, one thing, one quick thing I want to show you also is that you can generate a report. And... It should come up pretty soon. If it doesn't, I'll move on. How do you, do you verify before you use the data, the, uh, the census data? How do you, how do you know, you know whether people in the, in the city center, maybe more people actually fill out the census data than actually fill out the Well, we are. We are. Well, we accept census data. Yeah, census data is pretty good data, actually. Um, we accept that. So what, what do we do with data? The two, there are two parts to this engine. The engine is, part of it is direct data-based. So there are databases that are maintained, and we keep that going. Part of it, though, is proxy data. So the PhD was all about taking the physical form of the city, building footprints, building to building distances, road uh, areas, uh, density of intersections, and predicting the energy and material uh, through the energy and material in place uh, of those things, and we did a lot of work to verify that that was correct. And we got within ten. So the error here is about ten percent for all of that. So we can we now know, and I'll show you the typology work. I'm, go I'm going a little bit slowly, but I'll show you the second big project I want to show you is a typology of cities. And now what we're doing is we know this city in New York is one, part of one type. For all the other cities within that type, we can use a lot of the work that we did for this city for that, for those cities. So I'll show you that in a second. You had a question? By the way, this is the report that you can get, which is, gives you the actual numbers, gives you the data sources, um, and then gives you, um, in relation to other cities, where the population comparison is material composition, sorry, material comparison, energy comparison to other cities. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's where we are right now with the tool. So we don't include, we don't include the flux in population due to work, to commercial. So it is people living there. So, the, so right now the tool is, if you live there, this is your material and energy uh, consequence, right? So the next phase of the tool will be to include commercial and, and um, other ways of looking at it. But right now, that's, that's what we got at. Okay, so I'm going to go to, so that was an a image of the, of the report, and I just want to show you a little bit what we gathered some data. I, sometimes I hesitate to show this because my, my student just went ahead and gathered this data from people who are using the tool. So this is, this is where all the queries were coming from. This is just in the, I think this was just in the first week. Um, the, this, these are the actual outlines that people created of areas that they were interested in. So there's a huge range there. And this is um, actually the next slide I want to show you, architect, engineer, and planner. And when I presented this, the planners were really, really interested because they said, you know, there's nothing else that tells me intuitively, at least in a comparative way, how do different parts of the city compare in terms of their overall resource requirements. And the thing that we found, which was really interesting, there is the, the area of inquiry was kind of bimodal. There was a pretty fine resolution, pretty small. This is kilometers squared. And then pretty large. You know, people were looking at 30 kilometers square areas. 
not a lot in between and not anything above that. And again, we mapped some of those areas. Okay, I'm gonna have to move a little faster. Oh, actually, I did wanna say one thing. So the person who with me over five years developed this tool is David Quinn. Daniel Wiesman also helped him. And they actually um, developed this tool. It's not, we were thrilled to find that there's a market for this sort of thing. They opened up a company called Co-Urbanize. What they do is they offer urban data acquisition, processing, and representation to different stakeholders. They have um, community boards and developers are, two, are the two main clients. They have one non-paying client, which is the city of Boston that wanted pro bono work from a spinoff, which is kind of a weird idea, but um, the, the, they're actually doing pretty well so far. So it's kind of an interesting new model for urban consultancy. Okay, the second, big, the second big project, which I have about five minutes to tell you about, um, is urban typologies. Okay, so the basic question we wanted to ask is, of the thousands of cities out there, if I were to map their urban resource consumption, how intensively do they consume energy, water, materials, biomass, whatever, would they group into clusters, or is it a smooth gradient between the smallest and the largest? That's the basic question. Okay, there are other, sorry, there are other typologies that we know of, but we found that there was, n there hasn't been so far a typology based on the urban resource consumption. So it seemed like new territory, just an image on one of those typologies, global cities, Saskia Sasson made her career on this. And the idea was we're tracking consumption, it's a purely statistical analysis, and then we affirmed our results with, through case studies. And we arrived at this, that we wanted to answer the question of how many variables, what's the least number of variables that you need to understand, data points about a city, to predict, for the most part, its re urban resource consumption. And we found that populations, some measure of affluence, city GDP, climate, and population density were the four that you needed. If you know that about a city, you can predict, for the most part, its urban resource consumption. I would go into the, the method that we use to get there, but if you have questions afterwards, I can maybe tell you. The dependent variable is, are, the, are the resources that we tracked. So given those four independent, how do, what do they um, consume in terms of these? These four are part of the material flow accounting methodology. And then we also added CO2 for consumption proxy, and we did not actually track water. So here's the, here are the results. This is biomass, so paper, wood, food, fossil fuel, total energy, electricity, CO2 emissions, industrial metals and minerals, total materials, and construction minerals and metals. And if you do the statistical analysis, you come up with first phase results are 15 city types. So this 15 city types, sorry, Boulder's not included here. We didn't, we didn't include it, but um, from Kolkata, Phnom Penh, so obviously cities in developing regions to those profligate um, uh, consumers of resources like Boston, uh, Melbourne, Sydney, affluent cities. Some highlights, so the most, uh, the most urban, the most efficient cities are the poorest. Clearly not a model for the future. The middle range is interesting because you get some things like electricity consumption is very low. You get mid-range consumption for all other materials. Um, again, transition economy cities are an interesting model because they're actually fairly resource efficient. So Lisbon, Belgrade, Buenos Aires fit in here. Um, and then you get cities in which they're fairly low consuming in lots of materials except the CO2 emissions are super high. And these are coal fed regions, so the number of Chinese cities fall in here, and then, as I said, the wealthiest cities in, the de in developed countries. A transitions thought experiment is to suggest where should we go in terms of sustainable cities? What are the best models? And the best models are not here because these cities are resource efficient because they're underserving their population. Um, they're unjust places to live. These cities, obviously, not a good model, so it's the middle zone. Just want to highlight one type in this middle zone. Japanese cities, as much as we tried to put them into some other classification or to include some city in their group, are, looking, are like no other cities in the world. 
they're a type onto themselves. It's kind of interesting because high fossil fuel, high electricity, low biomass, low total, total energy. They're actually quite energy efficient, but very, very high material consumers. And that's because you have a society that is, at least our speculation, a society that's quite resource efficient, but highly, highly industrialized. Okay, so uh, sorry for the graphics here, but that's the, the goal is to bring these cities up, to bring these cities down, and the ultimate goal is to bring that middle zone down. Okay, so some key publications. Um, we've already, this work has already been adopted by the UN, much to my anxiety. Um, I just came out with a book, Sustainable Urban Metabolism, if you want to know more, and I've got another book coming out. Um, this is a very quick slide to say, we've gone through a phase two, and my, I had a hunch that the 15 types were not so robust, so we applied a whole number of other statistical methods and came up with a clustering of eight. The Japanese cities still are onto themselves as a group, um, but a number of these groupings make a lot more sense than they did before. Finally, we're doing a subtypology of African cities, and we're soon to start a subtypology of Asian cities. Okay, I think what I'm going to do is leave it there. Um, there, we've uh, well, actually, let me just say a word about we've done some work in. Given all of that, what do you do, right? So there's been a lot of talk about urban technologies or new ways of doing things. So we've developed this whole report on alternative urban technologies. Um, we've developed a few of our own um, recently, um, including some design here. And then last thing that I'll say is, uh, last piece of this, just the last couple of slides. Um, so I, I mentioned that I wanted to talk a little bit about education. The main point I want to make is that all of the work that we've done is centered on the idea that design, as I started the talk, design decisions need to be placed in a more informed context for resource consequences. That's the point. We are absolutely not educating our designers today to be able to do that, even though there's life cycle, there's energy modeling and all that, but we've got a long way to go. I've been involved in a project to set up a uni new university in Singapore. I was the, the head of the architecture department there for the last few years um, to set it up. This is, the, this is a rendering of the new building in Singapore on the east side of the island. Um, it's a university for 10,000 students in steady state. And there are four departments, and one of them is architecture. In this region of the world, architects and civil engineers are in huge demand. Uh, it's a huge amount of building over there. Um, so we've, we threw up all the assumptions about architectural education and decided that what we would actually educate are designers who understood the resource consequences. So the name of the department's architecture and sustainable design. So it's a very different kind of education. I can go into more detail. This is just a lot of information actually. I shouldn't have put this in here. But there's about, they're a little more, actually, th these numbers are low, about 700 students so far. MIT is, this is not an MIT satellite campus, this is just us consulting to set up this university. This industry collaborations are huge, collaborations are huge, and there's a number of resource, research um, programs there. Um, this is maybe not. You have an similar structure here where you have a capstone. Uh, it was described to me today. Um, the, the, thing that, the other thing that we did was there's at the beginning, right at the beginning of the this is undergraduate curriculum, all students take an introduction to design class. So all the engineers and architects all learn about design and different methodologies in design. So the capstone becomes another version of that in the end. And basically it's all about designing with resources in mind. How do you at the same time that you're, that you're designing, have a sense of what the resource flows are. Apologize for going so quickly in the last little bit. Um, thank you. Do you have any questions? <laughs> so I'm sorry I didn't leave much time for questions. 423. Could you leave the second to last slide out a little more? Uh, one more. So I'm, I'm, I see you have dynamics, linear system. Yeah. So all the students take the, all the students take all of this, including the architects, right? And one one of the and so one of the so here's the thing. The, the architect 
we were just talking about this, that everywhere the, the architecture students are a self-selected group of which a certain portion of that group doesn't really like this stuff. Let's just be honest, right? right? The fact is though, if you can get the lion's share of that self-selected group, at least to be knowledgeable about this, what happens is that they can then talk to the engineers who frankly don't really want to know about aesthetics and precedent and form and all of that, right? If there's enough of a common language, and that is really the, the key takeaway from my experience, is that language is super important. Language and experience, those two. So the other example I was talking to John about earlier was that some things that architects do, we've brought down into this introduction to design class. For example, the continual feedback loop with your peers. Architects go in front of their peers and they, get, they do a pinup. You know that, right? Do any of you, are you, have you been to pinups, reviews, architecture? Okay, the, with their peers, with the faculty there, that's continual feedback loop. And it's crowd-sourced information, basically. The engineers now are like, wow, this is great. This is fabulous. Well, by the way, we've been doing it for about 300 years, right? And the engineers now want to do that kind of thing. Whereas the architects know that there are some design, quantitative design methodologies that we don't use, we don't talk about, we don't even want to get anywhere near them, that engineers use that actually would probably benefit architectural design. So, there's that, so that was, that's part of having a really intensive mix of design methodologies in the first portion. And that makes the capstone much, much more, more natural and much more, we're, we haven't gotten there yet, but it seems to me it's going to be much more, e much easier to do because already we see in these classes that the architects are talking to the other students all the time. There's not a, as much of a separation as I see in architecture schools. Yeah. On the typologies, do you have a sense for how sensitive the typologies are to like political or geographic context, historical context, like if it was a colonial city, a poor city, a city in a resource-rich area, is that do we know how robust these are when we consider those kinds of things? So it's interesting. Um, one, one way that I answer that question, not exactly that question, but um, so part of my contribution to this whole aspiration to green cities is to provide a scientific basis for actually knowing whether we're doing better or not in the future. So if we have targets, whatever, to knowing, and part of the answer to that question is, so how are we doing now, right? And then, so the typologies is just physical stuff. I know, I'm interested, I'm an architect in environmental justice, governance, in, um, uh, institutional robustness, all this stuff is there, absolutely. And it's deterministic, it's important. I don't cover it because my contribution is just going to be in the physical stuff. I ha we have started as a group having some really interesting collaborations with the non-urban metabolists who tell us about, oh, well, this is interesting. These two types are because of colonial, long-term colonial occupation or whatever else. That's interesting, but again, we're, we're just starting to enter in the, into that discussion. And I'm not a historian or a sociologist, so I wouldn't ever want to say that I know about those things. It'd be really interesting because maybe the typologies kind of supersede that and maybe we realize that sort of the current sort of metabolism says maybe more than kind of historical context. So what, one of the most interesting conversations I've had recently is with Jim Westcote, who's a, a person at um, MIT in the Aga Khan program and he's an uh, expert in water. One, one conversation we had was all about the culture of reuse. So um, in India, for example, the, there's a by necessity, but now by kind of just by culture, everything is reused. Um, and how do you transition Kolkata or Mumbai, the poorest parts of Mumbai, to retain that culture of reuse by formalizing and all that, but still creating affluence, right? Because once you create affluence, why am I saving? Why am I reusing? I don't want to reuse, right? So how do you do that? And that's substantially a cultural issue. That's not a urban metabolism industry, but that, those are the kinds of linkages between what we do and others. Oh, it is, absolutely. And it's very, very clear that with affluence, there's an enormously strong driver to go straight to Boston Phoenix. I mean, not to, not to, I mean, in fact, I'm an optimist, 
But I would say there's no question that what's going to happen is this whole group is going to come down to here pretty quickly. Um, in that 90% of urbanization that happens in the developing world and that huge, and hopefully, actually, hopefully, huge number of people who do get richer, right? I don't think there's any way we're not gonna find ourselves down here. So I think we're in a very, I think we're in a transition period where um, we're gonna see an uptick, significant uptick in urban resource consumption before we see a downtick. One example is air conditioning. So air conditioning in China and India, in, in India, right? People lived without air conditioning for, uh, the first thing you do when you can afford it is buy a car and buy an air conditioner. So I don't see how we're gonna, that's really hard to work against that. Sorry I didn't leave a lot more time for questions because I suspect we'd have some interesting conversations. Do you think that's apology? Um, is it delineated by climate in any way or not? No, the strongest, so the strongest indicators are one, energy, two, affluence. Those are the stronger forces, and they pretty much completely overwhelm climate. Yeah. Because we found two cities, identical city size, then population density, and their only difference in terms of affluence, and one is extremely low consuming, and one is extremely high consuming, right? So climate had no, no effect. Any other questions? Do you think about more effect we made on older established cities that are trying to have retrofits, or these developing cities and developing countries that are still in that kind of first row, and so we can kind of affect change by saying, hey, let's, let's build a city smarter from the beginning, or do you think that it'll happen more cities that are already built, let's go and make some changes? Well, that's, a, that's kind of the key question. Um, I, I think the, 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 the potential for impact is no question on the, developing, uh, the cities in developing regions, just because of the numbers, the population increase and all that. Um, it's, there's some good indicators that um, environmental movements are, uh, are being established and accelerating faster than they ever did in the, in the West when the cities, when, city, when that rate of, when urban populations were also increasing in terms of percentage numbers. Um, we didn't see the same kind of percentage increase over time as we're seeing, so it's hard to compare. But one would, there are some suggestions that maybe some leapfrog effects could happen. So for example, um, you know, again, in China, first thing, what, what's happened is a lot, lot less people ride their bikes now in, in Beijing, right? Uh, it used to be, and um, it's possible that we've hit a plateau on that and maybe because of pollution and congestion and all that, there, w the introduction of bike share could happen in Beijing, whereas you know in New York City it would just recently happen in Beijing, maybe it happens at a much earlier stage in its development. So that's a positive, optimistic view. Unfortunately, I mean, in terms of the larger numbers, I think we're headed for some pretty difficult times in some cities. The, the, other, the other thing to say about that is that I've, I've painted this in terms of global resource consumption, but who cares about global resource consumption? Countries certainly don't. Countries care about their own, right? So some parts of the world may be really, really difficult for quite some time, and others will be just fine. So, you know, Northern Europe will be great. In fact, global climate change might help out a little bit, right? So. Um, have you looked at, uh, I don't know if I answered your question. No, okay. um, have, have you looked at the psychological and physical well-being of uh, changes in the cities? No, not at all. Not at all. No. Again, that's kind of outside of what I yeah. can do with my students. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious what you think about urban decay. I mean, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking about Detroit. Yeah. What does Detroit look like? And then a theoretical limit in the future when we do hit that carrying capacity for resources what happens to all these established outlines as they have to shrink down? So you'll see Detroit's right in here. And what we, what we found was uh, because it's shrinking, it's there. Per capita, you've, you're, you're sustaining a very widespread infrastructure for, a, for less and less people. So there's a guy, Brent Ryan, who does work at MIT on shrinking cities.
And that's a huge challenge. What do you do? So, and that's, again, not so much a physical question as it is, that's a political, cultural, how do you tell people to condense and to move out of places? So that, that's a, so, but just to give you some sense of what, what we're thinking is, uh, what, what, what we're thinking now is that in, in the alternative urban technologies, one major stream of, one major principle that runs through a lot of that work is decentralized urban infrastructure. So as opposed from having you know, the central core or some large plant or a couple of large plants that service a huge amount of city, you basically are servicing by district, by city district. And already that's happening in a lot of places, um, uh, heating districts, right, and heating and cooling districts, and transportation, walkable cities and all that. And so Brent seems to think that the idea of um, decentralized urban infrastructure and shrinking cities go along, go together really, really nicely. The other piece to this is there's some work that shows that polycentric cities, cities that are very widespread but have very distinct centers and, and essentially, you know, uh, sub-agglomerations within the larger, are really efficient. Um, they're, they're quite, they're socially, um, economically, physically, they're actually kind of a sweet spot. And that's the, the Atlanta model is kind of like that. That started to show polycentric centers. And you, we know cities like that. Some parts of Los Angeles are like that. London certainly like that, um, where you have neighborhoods within the city. Neighborhoods make up the city. And the neighborhoods are fairly self-contained. Um, so that's kind of the direction I think things are going. All right, due to the time, we'll stop here. For those of you who have questions, and we'll come to talk to John after the seminar. Okay, let's thank Professor Brandis for the welcome. Thank you.